Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for coming this afternoon, and uh, welcome to our venture panel on venture capital uh, 2020. And this afternoon, we're going to talk about where venture's been over the past few years and where it's heading. Um, I just want to thank Mike and the whole Milken team for a great conference as always. Uh, so much fun and just uh, so great to be around so many smart people that are thinking about big problems uh, to solve in the world. Uh, we've got a great, here today, a great group here today. Uh, some are not only peers, but also great friends. And um, all their detailed bios are in uh, the Milken app uh, or program, but I wanted to quickly introduce our group here. Um, we've got Dave McClure of 500 Startups. Primarily focuses on early stage. Uh, Kay Kokmovitz uh, of Springboard, who focuses on growth stage. Um, Dr. Oz, who besides being a world-renowned surgeon and host of a popular TV show, is an amazing angel investor. Uh, Bonham Bao uh, of Bonham Ventures, and, uh, and he's focused on, uh, he's helped a lot of large corporations with their venture investing. And I have a TV show too. How can we just talk? Oh, about yeah. <laughs> We're just talking about that. It's unfair. True. <laughs> <Bonin>. <laughs> and uh, and last but not least, uh, Nikhil Kogadi. And uh, Nikhil focuses on moonshot investments. I think that's the uh, the, the best way to describe it. So. Um, we're actually going to start this off with a quick lightning round that will kind of get everyone uh, to know our panel a little bit better. So we're going to kind of quickly go down the line with a couple quick questions, you know, with uh, short answers so everyone has a turn. And then we'll kind of jump into the meat of our uh, discussion today. So we'll start uh, actually with Nikhil. Uh, what, what's the number one source for uh, finding good venture investments? Oh, man. Uh, well, in reality, it's through your network, but... Uh, if you want a strategic angle for it, uh, most entrepreneurs make references to their buddies and pals and the venture funds that have been investing, or any of us investing for 10 plus years, we probably get our best intros through successful founders we've worked with in the past. Going through, I mean, I think every single one of us wouldn't would look twice and put a red flag if a banker came with an early stage investment opportunity. I think most of us focus on early stage. So for us, it's success breeds success. Dave, what's your thought? Uh, other founders in our network, uh, particularly more experienced founders, we probably feel like they have a better sense of what's going to work than we do. So we take their opinions pretty seriously. Okay. It's going to sound pretty similar. It's from our entrepreneurs and our 4,000 experts in our network that uh, we source some of our best companies. And they're, I agree, it, they're people that really know what's going on on the ground and, and really know who's coming up behind them. So very good source. No, I, I'd agree with that. Team is always important. Mm -hmm. Bonin, what's your, what's your thought? <laughs> Everybody has the same <laughs> answer. answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> network, uh, definitely other founders. I get a lot of inbound as well. So, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at uh, new opportunities, but definitely it's network, founders, or you know, sometimes I'll be brought in by other investors. Very mm -hmm. cool. Dr. Oz, what's your well, thought? Well, just to be provocative, obviously pe people drive the decision making, but sometimes they're entities that you think could be disruptive enough that you're better off partnering with large folks. When we started ShareCare, which is something Court is uh, well equipped with, it's a company that connects people to the healthcare system. My partner was Oprah because we had media platforms we could tell a story to get people engaged in, take, in taking charge of their health. And then the infrastructure, which was hospital partners, the U.S. government, uh, insurance companies, you know, that, that came because those entities needed some glue to hold them together. So, but those models exist. And I also sometimes will do deals where there's a large company that has something that just doesn't quite fit and they don't know what to do with it, but I have the right person to lead the effort. And so it's still people, but it's a matter of connecting those people and sharing the same thoughts about how those dots might you know, make a picture one day. With that said, Dr. Rose, we'll go to the next question on that. What, what's your, the company you're most proud of in your personal portfolio? It would be Share Care. I have a bunch. I was thinking about this in preparation of today's talk. I, it seems like everything I'm doing has to do with a bed. Uh, we have uh, a, a business that works with sleep, so it tracks you in your bed. We have a business that puts you in hotel rooms. Um, uh, called Forbes Travel Guide, so you know, putting you in beds in hotel rooms. We have a, a device that's a watch that tells you when you're about to drop dead, so it keeps you out of a deathbed. Uh, the, the, the purpose of shared care, I know it gets bizarre, but it's true. The purpose of shared care is to keep you out of a hospital bed. And the reason I like it the most is because there are gonna be different ways we disrupt healthcare, and it's ironic now because you watch the debates, at least as you read about them in the papers, 
but having looked behind that, talked to some of the folks involved in the legislative initiatives, you realize we're just rearranging deck chairs in the Titanic. It, there is no way we can create a health care bill that we can afford, whether you're Democrat or Republican, is irrelevant. Uh, this is an American problem, and the only way we can deal with it is to deal with the infrastructure problem, which is that it costs twice as much to take care of anybody in this room, unless, of course, you live in a different country, because then that's sort of the norm. And so if it, costs, if it costs twice as much to take care of an American than a foreign individual in their country, then there's very little chance we'll make up that difference. So there's smart strategies, uh, I think, that could alter that, but the the key is to, to be at the T of the, of the squash court. You have to be in a place where you can build the ecosystem because if you try to build that solution and put it in someone else's ecosystem, um, the, by the very fact that it's being tra transformed from what you need it to be to what someone else needs as, for their business model, it won't work, which is why I think it's been held back. But I think because of the, of the ability for us now between AI and other initiatives to, to alter that landscape, those platforms are available and will be readily used by hopefully folks in this room and many others. So, Bono, what, what's your favorite in your portfolio? Yeah, well, I, I, what I was going to say, and I made light of it, was the show that we did do with LeBron, which was originally called Cleveland Hustles, and the whole idea there was how do we create models to revitalize neighborhoods yeah. uh, across this country, starting with entrepreneurs that are willing to uh, build storefronts on Main Street. And I don't think we really think about it because I, I do spend most of my time in tech, but I don't think we think about one of the biggest challenges that small businesses have right now is access to capital. There was a great panel on it today. Uh, and when we really think about what's going to revitalize neighborhoods and bring education up, crime rates down, it's really those Main Street businesses and we've done everything from a mom and pop bagel store where a guy would wake up at four in the morning, go cook his bagels in a, a shared kitchen, uh, and then he got too big, he had to borrow a friend's freezer, learned how to sell a bagel that tasted as good frozen as it did fresh, uh, and we built a bagel store, but I said, look, the bagel market is a $480 million market. I love a good bagel store, but the bagel, frozen bagel market hasn't been disrupted in forever. Lenders, right. Thomas's, so I put them on a plane and we sat with the uh, CEO of Box, and now we took them from making a truckload, uh, sorry, a truckload of bagels a month to a truckload of bagels a day. And through the efforts of Clues and Hustles, we were able to put 62 new jobs. Now that's small, and now we're expanding it to America Hustles and try to do that on a much larger scale. But for me, that is the thing that has been the most passion. That's what I've been doing over the last 12 months. Uh, and we were able to document the kind of how do you take those small businesses. And I think one of the things for me that I learned was, look, I come from PepsiCo, and I come from Mondelez, where I was chief mean and e-commerce officer, which is former craft. So I've always worked in billion dollar, really big businesses. Right. And so what I learned was that there's a lot of things that we can do from a big business standpoint in terms of what we've learned to help small businesses grow. And just because they're a small business doesn't mean that they need to think small. So there's a beverage company that clearly I, I worked at PepsiCo. I knew a little bit about soda, so we helped them. I brought them to the largest beverage incubator in the world. And so that's been the project that I'm most kind of passionate about, I guess. Yes, if that answers your no, question. No, no, no. That's very exciting. That's very cool. Kate, what's your, what's your thought? And what's your favorite in your portfolio? Well, I think I should say that um, I'm concentrating on, on investing in women-led companies in technology and life sciences. So my network is considerably different than other people here, here on the panel. So, um, and it's hard to pick the, the best because mm -hmm. we brought 660 companies through our training programs and uh, raised capital uh, with these companies. But so... Maybe I'd like to choose Zipcar or uh, iRobot or Constant Contact or Minute Clinic or any of these uh, companies that have come through with us. But maybe the biggest one yet is to come to market is CureMark. And CureMark is a company uh, started by Dr. Joan Fallon uh, for treatment for autism. And there isn't it's a large international issue. I mean, everybody in this room knows somebody with a child with autism or on that spectrum. And her treatment is really to improve cognitive ability, the ability to communicate as a, a person on the autism <clears throat> spectrum. And her product will be coming to market likely next year. Um, and it, it's an, an amazing story of a, a pediatric chiropractor who saw the problems of autistic children in her practice. And people told her, you know, she wasn't qualified to you know, do something like bring a drug to market. She wasn't a microbiologist. She never ran a company. She never did anything that they would ever invest in. But when she came to us in 2009, fortunately, I was in her screening room, and we have great talent on Brown in screening rooms. That wasn't me in that room. It was two microbiologists who had taken their product through the FDA. And they said, this woman, this is unconventional. What you eat affects your brain. But what she had discovered was that these children were by and large lacking the enzyme 
to digest protein. That affected cognitive ability, and that, pro that enzyme is now embedded in her product, which will be coming to marketplace, I believe, uh, in 2018. And I think it may be the biggest impact for the most people in the marketplace that we've seen so far. Wow, Here, that's, Mark. That's exciting. Dr. So, Joan Fallon. So, Dave, with almost 2,000 companies uh, around the world, how many countries are you in, and what's your favorite portfolio company, you think? Uh, you know, all my children are tall and beautiful. Uh, <laughs> But I'll probably pick three instead of one that nobody has heard of, and I'll try and take uh, as much time or less. Uh, Maven is a company out of Oakland, California, that does uh, hair weave extensions and beauty products for the African-American market, uh, which most people think is not a venture capital segment, but African-American women spend lots and lots of money on, on hair care products. Uh, the company was started by African-American and Korean, uh, and the African-American guy speaks Mandarin, and he's also half Jewish, but you know, I won't get into all of that. <laughs> um, and they did really well. They came out of our accelerator, uh, and you know, it took them a while to raise capital, I think, because of the segment that they are in. Uh, Andreessen Horowitz uh, did their Series A, uh, and I think Ben's wife is black, probably why he understands that market. Uh, TalkDesk is a company out of Portugal that's doing call center in the cloud. Uh, it's based on Twilio Platform, which is another one of our uh, companies that just went public last year. Uh, the company is in San Francisco now, 200 people, also came through our accelerator. Uh, the last one's a little unusual. Um, it's a company I'm on the board of. It's out of Saudi Arabia called Unifonic. Uh, have not taken any capital really to date, uh, although they're probably raising around somewhat soon, and they bootstrapped themselves to about $20 million. Uh, pretty amazing company, and gotten to know them and a lot of the folks in the Middle East over the last couple of years. Well, that's awesome. Those are all great. So, Nikhil, I know you just had a big exit this week, so uh, what's your favorite company in your portfolio? <laughs> This week, uh, my favorite company is definitely uh, Moat, which sold for around a billion dollars, which we were pretty happy about from the Series A. Um, but uh, Alibaba, for sure. Um, when I was at SoftBank, we did you know, 20 million into the Series A, um, which at the IPO Doesn't suck. was worth, uh, <laughs> that's, well, that's a third of 160 billion. So um, that, was, that was great. But for the last four years, all the things I've been investing in have been around Moonshot and maximum impact. Now, I'm not saying VCs are do-gooders. VCs are not. The founders are doing hard work. We're just pushing money around at the end of the day. You can dress it up all you want. That's mostly for LPs. But at the reality, uh, my favorite companies all fit around this investment thesis of uh, sustainability. Um, and for VCs, investing in sustainability is actually kind of hard. Um, so what I try to think of is what are industries that are, you know, multi-hundred billion dollar industries today that haven't been addressed by venture capital, and why is it that all the family offices are reigning in billions of dollars? Primarily because they're turning their, something's happened in their industry, like farming and agriculture. If you're a billion dollar family in the room, and you've made your money fishing, you've probably had to completely change your entire business model for hundreds of years into farming fish, which is now venturable. So these are the kind of sectors that I'm pretty excited about. In a single fish farm, I'm going to do 200, 300 million bucks in revenue um, and all the horizontal technology layers there. So there's companies like Forever Oceans be one example. Another couple of examples that I've done um, are in the chemical space. You know, one and a half trillion dollar industry, largely because of reg regulation, the manufacturing of chemicals has moved to Asia. And yet, a petrochemical process, which is really dirty and get very sick, like... Um, same thing as diamond mining and things like that. <clears throat> it can actually be brought back to America if you change the process entirely and you know, use genetically modified yeast. Or in this case with diamonds, for example, a company called Diamond Foundry that grows man-made diamonds in California and uh, sells them in the market at the same price. So these are businesses where it brings jobs back to America, not, not like coal, <laughs> but uh, uh, actually makes it better for the people that are involved in the economy, in the ecosystem as well. Yeah, the job creation piece around venture is just something that's just not talked about enough on how, uh, how important it is. Um, for this next question, I'm actually going to go to you, Dave, first, because uh, we talked about it a little bit uh, earlier. So what's your number one thing you look for in a potential deal or your number one deal breaker? Well, I think we're always looking for passionate and smart founders, but probably the number one thing I would say is lesson learned from my former boss, Peter Thiel, is I want to know something about the deal that everybody else doesn't. So particularly if everybody else thinks it's a really fucking hot deal, I'm like, why is, why is this not going to work? Uh, and 
you know, usually if we can find a contrarian investment that other people think isn't going to work, that's really, you know, what we want to invest in. And, you know, the allegory there is uh, if there's a room full of horse manure, my usual attitude is where's the pony? <laughs> uh, so that's <laughs> always trying to look for something that, you know, we think is going to work that other people don't. I don't know what's your thought on that. What's the number one thing? I'm going to come back to you in just a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it goes back to, for me, really, I, look, I came from uh, corporate venture as well. So for me, I think what Dr. Oz said was the most important, and we talked about this earlier, which is there's a lot of wannabe unicorns, and I love that dream, but the reality is a lot of them don't make it to that. And how can I find ecosystems that can create a better opportunity for the companies that I invest in? So, look, I come out of advertising, marketing, tech, but one of the things that I do is how do I scale, how do I use something like, you know, uh, a $39 billion business called Mondelez and then take a piece of tech and scale that across uh, Mondelez to kind of ensure potential success. We were early with Waze, even before we actually built the ad platform in Brazil. Uh, we actually built a test here as part of our, our, uh, uh, our um, accelerator, our mobile accelerator, mobile futures at the time, and then moved the ad platform down to Brazil as they were expanding in Brazil and helped them build that, that out. Um, we helped bring WeChat into, into Latin America as well. And so stuff like that to me is what's really interesting. And so the companies that I invest in are also companies where I no ecosystems that I can plug them into so they can scale quick, because that's where the real challenge is, is how do you scale these businesses really quick so they can deliver upon that kind of billion dollar uh, dream. And then I also look for founders that allow me to help them rethink the way that you enter into the market. So i uh, give an example. There's a great company. Uh, it's actually part of Loeb Ventures, for those of you who know Michael Loeb or have seen that house in billions, that's his. Um, he, it's, uh, it's called MobiSave, and so they're a receipt scanning platform. A lot of competition in the marketplace, a bunch have been bought. They were, um, it was costing them about eight to twelve dollars to acquire a new customer for a download. And then they would go into a large organization and say, hey, we have not as many as some of our competitors, but will you take a shot on us? And so what we looked at, we said, you know what, instead of doing that, why don't you go into the organization and say, put a, a sticker on the pack of Oreo and it's manufacturer rebate if somebody downloads the app and scans the receipt. All of a sudden, you brought your cost of acquisition down to $4.50 and you're walking into a company and saying, we're actually going to give you money just allow us to put a sticker. That transforms the doors that open, you know? And so, so founders that allow me to help reshape the way that they go to market, are, that's what's interesting to me, ecosystem founders. So you bring up a, you bring a good point about Michael. Um, so Michael Loeb has a whole group, he's a friend, he's, yeah. he's a whole group of companies. And one of these companies, which shall remain nameless, he co-founded, incubated, grew up, <laughs> staffed, funded, does about 100 million in EBITDA annually. It's a great business, funds a whole bunch of other activities. It's a transformational business too, yeah. Absolutely. How come I in got the, to in the healthcare one of business? You didn't, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the, what's happened over the last seven years, if you've seen, for better or for worse, funds including some of ours, but 480 new seed funds emerge over the last, let's call it five years, roughly. And when so much little capital enters the market, that means a lot of companies are getting funded, but that means over the deployment of that period, you're going to begin to see the haves and the have-nots. And you're going to see some funds grow up to become big funds and be able to support their companies throughout their life cycle, and you're going to see a whole bunch of companies, a whole bunch of funds sort of just have one offs or two offs and then kind of go by the wayside. So what does that mean for the next several, next five years of venture? I think you're going to end up seeing this model that Michael ends up creating and begin to dominate where some of these individually wealthy folks want to get into venture but don't want to raise outside capital because they see what's happened over the last five or six years. <clears throat> and you're going to have this startup studio model, mm. I think, become more and more prolific. And we already have, what, studio. a couple dozen around that we could probably all name across the United yeah. States. And it, I think it's becoming, you see more of the studio model developing right now in New York, and you see it in LA, you see it in a couple other places besides Silicon Valley. Yeah, I don't think and proliferation like, think of a model like is necessarily a point of success. Just because there's a lot of people doing it doesn't mean it's Agreed, yeah, it doesn't agreed, mean but it if, you look, be, no. if you look at the, <laughs> the risk to reward across the life cycle of venture capital, you have growth stage. At the point of exit, you get a couple of points, but the IRRs are good because the duration is short. As you go down from Series D or pre-IPO to Series A, you've got at exit, what would you say, 10% at exit? 
on average at best, yeah. maybe 12. Depends on entry point and exit. I mean, different series A. Takes. I mean, typical entry point for series A is 20 to 30 percent. Right. And so at exit, you're going to be at least half that. So if they maintain it'll still be the same. But yeah, the point is you got, you know, barely double digits kind of upside at the end. Yeah. And if you go to seed, it gets, it gets more, more diversified. But as you go to co-founding businesses in the startup studio model, you can have 30 plus 40% sure. at exit. So, I mean, if you're starting a venture studio, you're going to have a larger stake in the enterprise, but you're going to have a more concentrated portfolio. Risk 100%. is going to be higher. Agreed. So yeah, you have a to lot of his businesses rely on the same kind of central model, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, it's a different way to look at ownership, and risk is higher. If you are a better entrepreneur, then that will result in success. But you're probably, in a venture studio, only going to be able to do one or two, maybe three sort of projects per year. Um, and so you better be correct about the, which yeah. one of those is going to work. Uh, typical venture stats are, you know, at Series A, probably not more than 10% to 20% of your investments are going to generate yeah. significant well, I, uh, returns. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment about this because um, our investment is predicated on a, a large pool of entrepreneurs that we bring into a trading program to raise capital, and they're usually in for Series A. 86% of our companies do raise capital over 17 years, track record. 81% of them are in business today, 170 exits, 14 IPOs. I mean, you can stay with it, but you've got to stay with these companies. And we're talking about, okay, venture capital, we all put money at different stages and different reasons. We put money into different companies. But what real value mm -hmm. do you add beyond money? And I think that's really a key point for us it's a network of 4,000 experts that are in different areas of technology and life sciences that are experts at different levels. So it's getting the right people into the company to advise at the right time when you need it or access to the right person as an entrepreneur when you need that access. That is really critical. And I think that's why, you know, in, in our portfolio, companies are really going on to liquidity. We stay with them very and really work on business relationships, which I think is as important to an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur. I built a multi-billion dollar business in media. I, I know what it's like. You get, if you can get to the right people at the right time to grow your business and get revenue in, that's, as an entrepreneur, really important. And that's the vitality of what all of us can bring besides money to this marketplace. So, so with almost 65% of venture being deployed on the West Coast and in New England for these outlier markets, how, how do you see bringing those resources that uh, are so readily available in Yeah, uh, it's the a, West there's Coast a concentration of capital in certain markets, but we have companies in 39 states and on six continents. So we do a lot of our work virtually, and we connect people virtually, and we've done that since the beginning. Uh, when it wasn't quite as easy 17 years ago to be so virtual. But it is really in concentrating on those that you bring to the forefront, really still making those connections. You can do it. Unfortunately, you know, if you come from, let's just say St. Louis, um, and you've got a great company, and we've got a great cybersecurity company out of St. Louis, well, there's angel money around there, and there's some early stage seed money, but there isn't a lot of venture money to really scale that company. So, yes, we have to bring that company, but we also can help them stay there. We think it's important. Yep. And i got to say this from a woman's point of view as an entrepreneur. A lot of women want to stay in their communities. They've got kids. They've got other things. They really like to stay there if they could, if they could bring the capital in to them. So I think you know, talk about people like Steve Case who are going around and saying the best of the rest and trying to find companies in different parts of the United States. We find them in different countries like Israel and Australia and India and China and so forth. We do find companies there too, but most of our companies are in the United States spread out, but you've got to be able to bring them to the marketplace where capital is not necessarily have them move, but you've got to bring them to that marketplace to really work with people. And they've got to be willing to come back and forth somewhat to, because most investors want to be able to be close to the companies they invest in. We, we think it's, so. uh, personally, from our perspective, we, so we invest throughout the U.S. and around the world. And yeah. we think the outlier markets are really interesting. We, had, um, we do, too. We've it, got a lot of our companies are in, I don't care if you call it Florida, Wisconsin. We've got 10 companies in Wisconsin. We, I'm from Wisconsin. You wouldn't <laughs> think that you'd have 10 companies uh, in cybersecurity and technology and biotech, but we do. Well, it really takes the entrepreneur going out. One in particular is actually the one that uh, we're a partner with Dr. Oz with in uh, ShareCare that's based in Atlanta. And mm -hmm. Atlanta has such... Uh, 
an active angel community. It does. It's real, really come real on strong in the last five happened. years. It's come on very strong in the last five years in Atlanta. I've been impressed, actually. With, with that, Dr. Oz, you know, what, you really incubated share care with Jeff. So what, 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 what motivated you to do that? What, uh, what was kind of the primary driver behind that, you know? And obviously, it's been very successful from a financial standpoint, but what kind of led you in that initial process? So Jeff is Jeff Arnold, who uh, started WebMD. And uh, Jeff's the CEO, and he's had a, a really good leadership team. But early on, we were still trying to figure out uh, how this would function practically in the American healthcare system. So just to give you two seconds of background, uh, I, I had just uh, announced we were going to launch my show, and I had, was doing the Oprah show still. And the idea was that we would build something that would allow our viewers to be integrated with the show experience. So imagine a social media built around television. And Jeff very savvily said, well, you should do that, but you're not, that's not a business. And so if you really want to make this work, if you can take care of touching people in the way that makes them trust you, because trust is probably the most effective, certainly the most legal performance enhancing drug. So you get people to trust you, then uh, we can build a business behind that because once they trust that you're giving good advice, then telling them not to get back surgery or to look at the medication prices and trust the one that's lower, even if it's generic, or make a decision about an insurance company to work with, all that becomes much more doable. There's businesses there. But the front end, the, the traditional uh, B2C model was not gonna be able to work in healthcare. And so the incubation process that Court speaks to is the years that it took to get that infrastructure uh, right, which meant you know contracts with the Department of Defense, the largest for-profit health insurance, uh, rather the, for the largest for-profit hospital system, HCA is a partner of the largest nonprofit system. All these have to come in place, but it takes a while for them to get comfortable and to to trust that you have the way of tracking their medical records, making doctors' appointments, transparency, and drug pricing, etc. But none of that is going to work. I don't think, unless they are hearing from you fairly frequently, the consumer, and trusting what you're telling them. Even simple things like the insurance company regulations about talking to their customers, which they're obliged to do. I don't know, put your hands up. How many of you read the notices you get from the insurance company? Right? No, no one does. Even the bills are un unintelligible. The mandatory written documents that they send you by law, you never read because why would you bother? So if you can get them enticed, excited about whatever they're about to hear, they're more likely to follow through on what they hear when they're in a crisis. And so in, our, in the insurance care business, we had to incubate that, to give time for people to trust that so that we could build a business around it. But I still think it was the right thing to do even without that because it would have slowed ultimately the ascent of the business if we immediately jumped to the money-making part day one. That's great. Yeah, no, it's one of my, uh, it's, I, I love that business because uh, it's not only been very successful um, you know, from a financial standpoint, but I think is obviously doing a, a great job. From, Can I from point a, one thing? So Georgia Tech is a collaborator of ours. There are technical schools which get forgotten. Mm. I mean, they, they, yes, Georgia Tech has a good football team and basketball team, but they, they're a great engineering school. And so we forget about the fact that they're high quality tech, uh, schools that, that excel at STEM that are outside Silicon Valley and you know, the greater metropolitan area in New York City where I live. And when we go to those schools, Georgia Tech in particular, they wanted to work with us. They were willing to bend over backwards. Deans were excited about getting their students to intern at ShareCare, which is based in Atlanta. We had access to capital from Nashville which is another hub for, for health businesses. So there's, these were sort of forgotten areas where there's Nashville is very big in healthcare. Insight. I mean, there's a lot moving into, a lot of money moving into Nashville too yeah. in the health sectors because we, I know we have a number of companies that are financed out of there and the Frists have been very uh, proactive in, in that area out of, out of Nashville as well. So, so Bonham, and we've, we've capital talked and other places. Bon, and we've talked a lot about, like, obviously, technology and, and healthcare, and obviously you have a great deal of experience with non-technology investments as well. You know, obviously you mentioned your bagel company, as well as obviously your work with Mondelez. Where, where do you kind of think, you know, the venture environment stands for for those areas? Why didn't you bring any bagels, by the way? <laughs> or Oreo <laughs> cookies, I could have, you know. <laughs> and, well, no, I heard, I heard that. I ignored that when you said that, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, so actually, so to that point where I think actually the biggest space right now is, I definitely think that um, nutritional snacks, so I definitely think the food and beverage space, and I think you're going to see, I, I know from my past life, the m a it's going to be, I believe, probably one of the largest m a environments that we'll see in food. Hmm. And it's interesting because having come from PepsiCo, I remember the day I left, there was an article that said, stop selling nutrition, start selling sugar water, right? Huh. And, and then two years ago, there was an article in Fortune that said, Indra was right. 
And it basically, because nobody has a healthy portfolio. And the consumer moved, and they didn't see the consumer moving, no matter how many times people told them, and now they're stuck flat-footed without real, uh, any healthy in their portfolio. And now you see all these smaller companies coming up with really true nutritious, healthy snacks, new um, ingredients, whether it's crickets or, you know, <laughs> I, I, well, literally, you know, and, and, and what they've forgotten, so I used to run e-com, and we took a business pretty significantly big in a large organization, but what they forgot was that the distribution channel that's available now to these companies puts them on the same level as a, as a large conglomerate. And so these companies are getting big. So I also think the other piece that's interesting is beauty. You know, look at what's happening in the beauty space. A small company like Becca can be created on Instagram and then bought for close to a billion dollars by Estee Lauder in three years' time. It's really interesting, and they're disrupting beauty. And, you know, a lot, what, what's, what's interesting is I, somebody big in the beauty space was talking, we were talking, and they said, look, the hmm. beauty consumer used to be loyal. Now they're promiscuous. How do we make them loyal again? And I said, well, that's never going to happen. The better thing is how do you make a business model for a promiscuous consumer? And when you look at the stores that are doing well, like a Sephora, it's like a Disneyland for a promiscuous consumer. So I think you're going to see a lot, and a lot of those companies are using tech underneath that to reach a consumer subscription, those things. So I definitely think that food, beverage, and beauty are really interesting spaces right now. Um, and I am... I think that's focused. an industry that's being disrupted by the... Um uh, the individual and the consumer, just like a lot of other industries have yeah. been, like the media industry, the software industry, um, travel industry, you could name them all. I think that the access by the individual is really, it used to be that industry drove the individual. Now healthcare, food, beverage, uh, retail, uh, media, they're all being disrupted by the individual taking control. Yeah. And now the individual is in control of all these industries and where they're going, and it's a big challenge. And this is where the disruption of you know, venture-backed companies can really come in, is it's disruption of so many different industries, which will take us along to the next level um, of you know, how we have commerce, how we develop businesses, and it's going to be very interesting. We're in a very interesting time of this acceleration of exponential change in every industry. That's, I think, yeah. what exciting. we're all looking for are those people who are going to make those changes successfully, yeah. you know, and, and take us to a new level. <coughs> Dave, but, what's your thought around corporate VCs? <laughs> Uh, well, careful, aside Dave. from them being <laughs> evil, dumb, and slow, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I right. think, uh, you know, to get back to maybe a topic on trends to expect, I think, rather than just selling our book, um, you know, three large trends that I would uh, emphasize is that venture capital, which has historically been this tiny and poorly performing asset class, is actually starting to get better. Uh, and the reason that we're seeing that, people talk a lot about, you know, unicorns failing and not enough IPOs happening, and they're kind of missing the whole point which is there's been an explosion of late-stage capital that used to be coming from the IPO markets that's now coming from private capital. That's coming from uh, Chinese investors and lots of other international investors. It's coming from public market investors reaching down into the private markets. And it's coming from corporate investors that are moving in. And I think on the corporate side, you're seeing wholesale movement of the R&D budget of corporations going into venture and M&A, which actually has a lot more returns, a lot more commercialization, and frankly, they can outsource the risk to the venture capital community. Um, and the third one, I think, is just like venture expanding globally. And I'm not talking about India and China. Uh, I'm talking, although both of those are actually happening, but I think Southeast Asia, uh, Spanish-speaking Latin America, Arabic-speaking Middle East, and eventually Africa. Those are huge markets that most people don't think about as venture capital markets. But if you look at the demographics of those countries, internet penetration is rising from 10, 20, 30 percent above 50 percent. You have cheap Android phones. Uh, you have online payments accelerating. So pretty much all of those markets are wide open, and there's really very few venture capital firms in most of those places. Um, so I think you're going to see not a cyclical trend of unicorns and non-IPOs. What you're seeing is wholesale displacement of the early stage IPO market uh, to the venture market, right? And that's not going to change. How, how, do, you how do you think with deglobalization movements that, you know, with Brexit and everything that you think affects that? Uh, you know, I, I think that's, as much as that is fucked up and I think, you know, being driven by a lot of you know, whether it's Russian, social media, old people, poor people, lots of other things. I think actually, you know, that's a short-term uh, situation. Mm -hmm. I think for the most part, globalization is going to happen. I think there's lots of benefits to people, yeah. both rich and poor, in mm -hmm. terms of globalization. Uh, and we've seen, you know, reduction in global poverty, amazing 
levels in just the last 23 years, uh, 20 or 30 years. So people tend to be a little too short-term focused on the bad news when there's a lot, a lot of good news in all that. Um, I think that we're going to see less immigrant entrepreneurs in the U.S., uh, unfortunately. Uh, I think that Canada will benefit from that. I think India and China will benefit from that. I think a lot of other markets will benefit because those entrepreneurs will stay there. Um, and that's unfortunate. I think we're going to have a brain drain um, that's going to be um, negative for our uh, techni uh, technology companies. There's still There's a lot of great... nerds in Silicon Valley. I wouldn't yeah. worry yeah. too much about that. Well, <laughs> I know, but that's not the only place in the world, Silicon Valley. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, uh, there are a lot of places where people can go today, and I'm, I'm concerned about that. You know, I mean, I, I, I think it's important that we be able to attract the strongest um, people in science and technology and development. And, and, uh, and I think that we were just mentioning, you know, the other, other countries that are attracting them. And that's going to make it a, a competitive market there, um, where they're going to go. Uh, and will the capital follow them? And I think you're seeing, yes, the capital is starting to follow them. And, and this is a democratization of capital in a magnificent scale. Uh, don't forget, there are a lot of people in these different countries that are just coming into, you know, a subs uh, an existence that gives them hope that they can really rise up in their economies. And we haven't seen this many people come on because of the internet and the connections that we have today that they have, uh, and capital is moving in their direction. So I, I, you know, I think the democratization of capital is happening on all kinds of levels. In Canada, uh, and so, the world. So, so, so Nikhil, I got a question for you. You focus obviously on moonshot type investments. Yeah. What, what do you think the next big frontier is in venture? So like, like Masayoshi Son said on uh, Sunday, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in four or five years, but it's actually pretty easy to predict what's going to happen in 30 years, at least the trends that we can see today. So um, my approach is take the biggest, you know, the markets are hundreds of billions of dollars, put a filter on them that's like Maslow's lower half of his hierarchy, and then what are the, what are the trends that are making them venturable today? So I'm going to touch upon this question and the globalization one all in one answer. I think venture capital is like 30, 40 billion dollars, pretty small, but the businesses that they can apply to can affect hundreds of billions of dollars of individuals' lives. And the biggest thing that's going to happen in the next 30 years, 20 years, let's say, is that as transistors uh, and CPU gets to be infinitesimally small, um, or I should say one million times smaller than they are today, one million times more powerful than they are today, one million times uh, more reach than they have today generally, you're going to have connections everywhere. And eventually, you'll have them at the neuron level. And when you can measure, like we'd, if you guys have been paying attention to Brian Johnson's Neuralink presentation, Elon Musk, uh, sorry, <laughs> Elon Musk's Neuralink presentation, Brian Johnson's kernel, which he gave earlier today, um, the impact of being able to communicate almost instantaneously will be like the impact of Google times a million. So <clears throat> what that means is we've proven out across society that when coal plants shut down, people lose jobs and, and unfortunately are unwilling to move for those jobs. So we came to the thesis as a society that education is the answer. Well, education can be the answer if only people had access to that education and therefore could learn new skills. When computers get so small and we are connected to neurons, which will happen in the next 20 years, you can learn a skill matrix style. You don't need to be plugged into a machine into your brain. Now, I'm not saying you're going to learn Kung Fu instantly, <laughs> but I am saying you could learn a new language. You could learn a marketable digital skill within hours, wherever you are in the world, making you a part of not just the digital workforce, but any workforce and you can learn new skills. Now, that is how we will not need to have universal basic income. People will actually learn new skills, I believe, and that's going to be enabled by technology. So that's, that's 20 years. But how are you going to make money today is probably what you're thinking, because that's really, really hard to do. It's great if you're a billionaire like Elon and you want to start one of these companies and spend 10 years of research on it. So again, take the same philosophy, big-ass market, filter of some stuff that's important, and what makes it venturable today. I'd probably say the biggest thing, again, when you talk about what is affecting people in globalization, is housing, for me, is one of the, my biggest areas of interest. So <clears throat> what's happened in the trends last 30 years of housing? 
Average home is actually increasing, yet average cost of parts decreasing. What does that mean? Labor costs are dramatically increasing, especially in the United States. Okay, so everyone thinks, well, all that means I have to do is create prefab homes or you know, 3D printed homes, and that's all good and fine, and that can increase and decrease the cost of labor. But the real problem is that the average number of parts in a home has gone from 10,000 to 40,000, and it's really, really complex, because that's now tens of thousands and millions of producers, largely not in America, making these parts without any of the other people in mind. So the company I would invest in next, that I think could be a $100 billion company, and you could invest in it too over the next few years, would be a company that figures out how to build a home with 3,000 parts or less, and then builds it. And builds it for lots of different types of people, and it's a completely verticalized home building company. And I think that can be done today. It only takes a genius. It doesn't require computers with a million times more power, and it could support uh, customers in the US and elsewhere. So I, I guess think, if you're correct, I'd rather just invest in mortgage finance globally and cover all that shit. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, I personally think healthcare is going to continue to be, you know, where, where big opportunities lie. So, so Dr. Oz, obviously there's a great deal of uncertainty around healthcare in the U.S. What's your opinion on how you think that affects venture into the space and, you know, where potential opportunities lie given that uncertainty? I think there's uncertainty about who's going to pay, but there's not a lot of uncertainty in my mind that Americans will continue to value health. Yeah. It's an inflation, recession-proof space. You can't outsource it nearly as easily. Frankly, it's one of the biggest exports, probably number two behind entertainment of this country, uh, and it could grow to more. It's, a, it's an aspirational reason for people to spend money, so it's hard for governments not to expend cash when you hear folks from, you know, actually both of our speakers today, you know, the former president and former vice president, and I happen to do the Jimmy Kimmel show on Monday night when he spoke about uh, his son's tetralogy of below. It's a very moving, uh, a very emotional story about the fact that his son would not be able to get care if he hadn't been a you know, rich entertainer's son, uh, if, it, you know, if some of these new laws had been passed. This is not a Republican Democrat issue, by the way. This, once again, is a reflection of our nation's values. So I don't see us spending less um, for innovation. I think we'll, we'll, we'll waste less. We'll get more value from the money we do spend. So I think it's going to continue to be a huge value in venture capital investment in health. There's all kinds of places that disrupt the system. It is a remarkably archaic way we take care of folks. The, I mean, the only part of our life that's more archaic than medicine is education, which is basically an 1830s agrarian system that never evolved. But healthcare has gotten stuck in the 1960s somewhere. Our entire approach uh, as, you know, as Vice President Biden mentioned, it's still, you know, it's still a Second World War mindset because it, the biggest innovations were created by people who came from that generation, and it's been hard for us to move out of that. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I was uh, I, the inventor and, and funder of two of the devices that we use to replace per heart valves percutaneously, one for the aortic and one for the mitral. And I remember when I invented the mitral valve, it's a clip that we use. It's a, it's a very simple idea. Uh, it wasn't even my idea. I just miniaturized it so it would work. Uh, but I was beaten up about these because it would move patients from my specialty of cardiac surgery into cardiology. Mm. Well, that's not really a good reason not to do something. But that is a reality of the salvos that exist within medicine. And I'm at you know, Columbia University. It's a, and I, it's a prestigious institution with a proud heritage. And you still would feel this tension. So uh, it it's, may not always be changed from inside, which is why the ability to, if, even things like bloodletting, which doesn't have to be done in a hospital, can be done in your home, and there's no reason why it's not already pretty much routinely. Uh, ways of exchanging information, drug transparency. One third of all prescribed drugs are not picked up at the drugstore because people can't afford them. And part of the reason is not just because you don't know what it costs when I prescribe it. This is the hidden truth. I don't know what it costs when I prescribe it. So I have no idea what I'm costing you. So how could that possibly be a market system? These will be disrupted for sure. I know of companies that we're involved with or I mean, I'm looking at that are in this space that are gonna make a difference in the next you know, 18 months, 24 months. I'm not talking about 10, 20 years from now. And these will happen for sure. And especially as people have more leisurely times, I don't know what's gonna happen again in three years, but 20 years from now, I do believe that at least a third of the population won't need the work. They might wanna do something, but they don't have to work. So health will become a pretty powerful place for us to invest effort and, uh, and issues of longevity, in particular mental health, which dominate my audiences from based on our surveys concerns, will continue to draw huge investments because it's hard to figure out exactly how to do it for every one of us. But the more we can customize, which we'll do with this, 
uh, the more there'll be opportunities for startups that would become significant value entities over time. I don't know what you're saying, but what I'm saying, because we have one third of our companies are in um, the health sector. So a lot of uh, AI specialists and machine learning specialists are in healthcare IT, which is, and I think that the, again, the consumer becoming more involved in understanding the costs and the outcomes of healthcare are really going to change the treatment and the way we treat people and uh, how we can be more efficient in, in people getting the treatments that they really need. You see, that's, I, I believe very strongly that it's going to, that's part of what's going to drive the changes. This is not in a, get, going into devices and diagnostics and that sort of thing where we're going to see a lot of changes too, but just the healthcare system, how people, like ordinary people, interact with their health care is, to me, going to be driven by the consumer engagement and what they demand, what they want to know, and the transparency of the system, which we don't have today. You just pointed out that you don't even know what it costs when you prescribe somebody a drug. You're not even sure what they're going to have to pay for it at all because it's all negotiated behind the scenes or not. And well, I think just it depends to, what kind of health care service you have. Just to add to that, in court, if more, you have any. and more directly, court to your answer, we have gotten stuck in this belief that we either will have a health care system where we take care of free folks who don't have resources or a health care system that plays to people who have resources to spend their money more efficiently. There's really no reason we can't have both. Emotionally, we have to get past the fact that not everyone's going to manage their care the same, but if 80% of folks are able to manage their care and we empower them with the tools to be more efficient users of the healthcare system, and thus it costs less, and they, they therefore drive down cost and increase value, the other 20% of people who really need to have their hands held will have to provide separate systems that work equally well, but they'll get called about their mental health issue they haven't come in for. And it's going to be a bit more paternalistic, and again, it's uncomfortable to even uh, broach these themes, but we will get to a place where, as a society, we'll get comfortable with helping people who need help and getting out of the way of people who can do it on their own. And the technological, technological advances that are being invested in right now will facilitate that. That is for sure as much as globalism will continue, will be part of the future of how healthcare is delivered around the globe. Bonin, bef bon, before we um, uh, get to Q&A, what's the craziest, coolest thing that uh, you've seen out there, the sector you're most excited about? Like, what, what you, you've seen a ton from your yeah. vast experience. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, sorry, <laughs> okay. Um, so I, the sector, I, I, you know, I, I definitely think that healthcare uh, is is a huge opportunity as we move forward. But I definitely, again, think that food, and I think you're going to see a lot of stuff in the uh, about what I put in my body, uh, probiotics, and I also think that that merging of beauty and health, what I put in my body, also extends to what my, my I look like. And I think that those the merging of those two things is really, really unique and interesting, and we're seeing kind of that happen now because the reality is, is I think health and our understanding of health has changed, but we all are also, there's a lot of vanity in the world where we want to look beautiful. And now those two things coming together, I think are going to be really powerful. Uh, and so I, 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 uh, I, I like that. Um, uh, and what's the craziest thing that I've seen? Uh, I don't know what's the craziest thing I've seen. I, I think that... Uh, or that gets you excited. Uh, like... well, I, look, right now, right this second, I am highly focused on the messaging space. I think what we don't understand is that there's an entire generation of people that don't even know, a generation that doesn't even know email exists, that the only yeah. communication they have, and I wrote a book about it called Text Me 646-759-1837, but my phone number on the cover, that don't realize that messaging is the only platform they use. Five billion people are using messaging platforms today, and if you really think about all the technology that sits in and around social, I believe will be reinvented in and around this platform, and there's very little in the marketplace now, and even scarier than that is very little marketers are actually using these platforms, and so they're not even talking to an entire generation, and they're gonna get caught flat-footed again. And so right now, that's where I'm, I'm laser dialed in. Simple things like, why can't I change my flight by just texting Delta? Like, I mean, just stuff that tomorrow should be, like, you're like, yeah, that's gonna happen, that's not, so. Absolutely, no, that's big. How about you, Kay? I think some of the coolest things you see are on video, because I really do believe we're moving towards almost entirely video um, communication society. Uh, that is even more, you know, 
text, I think, is a forerunner of that um, in terms of massive communication. But I think it's moving, and I think what you're seeing in some of the things, people like to talk about VR, and having come from the media business, of course, you see a lot of VR, and you see it in the gaming, you know, the gaming industry is the most, I think, aggressive out there than the movie industry. But I do think that AR, augmented reality, is really going to be much more massive. It's going to be uh, embedded in... Uh, industry, yeah. um, and I think that's what is going to be the massive um, movement in video transmission, and it's going to dominate the internet by five years from now. Dave? Uh, I see a lot of crazy shit all the time, so I'd rather talk about boring stuff that just makes money. It's your personality. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess, you know, I'm a little skeptical of living in Silicon Valley and having been a science fiction geek all all probably 50 of my years, I would say AR, VR, AI, drones, all that shit's great, and it is coming, but it's a relatively capital-intensive business, and there's not very many platforms right now to aggregate those users. They're certainly coming in the next three to five years, but it's pretty hard to sell a VR content product right now. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you're DJI, it's pretty hard to break into the drone market. Mm -hmm. uh, AI is really just a lot of smart people. That's not a market. It's not even a product, necessarily. It's maybe in voice or audio recognition. So I think there's a lot of things that people are really excited about, which, frankly, have no business model and distribution channel yet. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of existing businesses that are relatively straightforward, that have an understood transactional business or lead gen business or subscription business that we are not that excited about. All of a sudden, subscription yep. e-commerce businesses seem to be in the shitter when you know, we have several of those that are doing really well. I think we you know, did a mobile claims insurance business in the Midwest that nobody seemed to be excited about. We saw a similar business in Thailand, and we went after that. So a lot of things we look at are sort of incremental or evolutionary, uh, uh, yeah, innovation over you know, evolutionary, not revolutionary changes. Um, doing those in global markets where there's not necessarily a hundred competitors, you know, not China because there are a thousand competitors. There. Um, and so a lot of things that are, you know, very straightforward, we think are great big opportunities. Um, one area that I think isn't overhyped is actually fintech, um, and the reason is why probably just because there's a huge amount of lending opportunity to unbanked, underbanked small businesses. Um, all over the world. Yep. And, and frankly, the spread <coughs> on borrowing and, and lending is huge, and one of the things that technology innovation can bring is bringing down those spreads. So I think there's an incredible amount of disruption, uh, insurance tech, lending, credit scoring systems, to some extent payment infrastructure, but that's pretty capital intensive. Um, and so they're not really crazy, and they're not really exciting, and they're kind of hard to get people excited about. Um, I could tell you why SaaS businesses in Japan are really exciting, but you probably think that's pretty fucking boring in a, in a country that's getting older and grayer. But that's coming, right? You have a country that's almost entirely online, but all the business executives have their emails printed out. And they're going to be wholesale switching to SaaS businesses over the next few years. We're going to see that revolution happening in all kinds of interesting places, but that's not a really very exciting business to talk about. But it's also happening. Nikhil? You're right. <clears throat> so... Um... I'll play a little trivia game, perhaps, uh, liven it up slightly. There's two industries. I had a chance to sit down with Clayton Christensen um, from Harvard last year, and, and I asked him, what are the two biggest opportunities to invest in that venture capital hasn't yet, or pretty much anyone, frankly, hasn't yet? And he said, well, that's pretty simple. What are the two things that every, almost every human takes part in that hasn't changed since the birth of mankind? Sex. Porn, porn sells pretty well online already. Yeah. Porn is good. <laughs> porn is pretty good. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> close, close. All these are close. I'll just give it to you. Um, food, interesting. Parenting. Parenting, you pretty much learn by observation or a few idioms that hopefully your family has shared with you. <clears throat> the second is religion. Uh, which, whether or not you are religious or have particular beliefs on it, is irrelevant. The vast majority of the world believes in something, and it's likewise, uh, similar to parenting, pretty much just learned it from their peers. And technology and other elements have not accelerated it. So, those are the two areas where I think it's most ripe. But, to Dave's point, things got to make money, so... 
the most exciting thing that I've actually seen with my own eyes uh, is I, uh, I, was, uh, I was visiting this, this healthcare company, Shaw Remain Nameless, and the, uh, the founder blew my mind when he showed me that he could cure myopia, uh, short-sightedness, um, without a procedure without LASIK, without cutting oh, your eye, amazing. and you could do it within a half an hour of you just sitting and chilling while I read a magazine and watch the TV and things like that. Wow. And 80% of children in uh, China are now myopic. 70% in India have eye problems. And in the US, it's gone up 15% over the last decade itself, That's largely amazing. due to these devices you have in your pocket. So as we're running short on time, Wait, you, you, you have to tell the name of the company now. You can't. I know, yeah. <laughs> but that's a great, that's a great yeah, business. Good for humanity. <laughs> We've got only a couple minutes left, but I wanted to open up to questions. If anyone had questions, yes. Hi, my name is Aubrey Ruby. I founded something called the African Expert Network. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, when people give you money to manage, they are trusting your decision-making <laughs> processes. So I'm curious as to how you defend good decision-making within your organizations, protect against groupthink, and uh, cover your, strategically try to cover your blind spots. And given that we talked about you sourcing deals from networks, often your networks are very uh, layered over each other, and you may not see or meet uh, entrepreneurs in markets like I cover, which are African markets, because they're invisible to your current networks. So is that a blind spot, and how do you address your blind spots? Sure. Uh, I guess, you know, everybody's trying to pitch, you know, how they can make 3x and 20% net IRR. 5x. And, and, <laughs> five, well, okay, then you're really lying if you're saying five. <laughs> Um, you know, most venture capitalists don't do that. In fact, I would say it's arguable which segment is worse, entrepreneurs or VCs, which one fails more often. Um, you know, I, I think we employ a strategy of making a large number of investments. You know, the name is 500 Startups, and we've done, uh, on our last fund, our third fund, we've made over 600 investments. Uh, the data that we gathered from the first uh, 1,000 companies or so seems to indicate that we get 50 to 100x outliers, the unicorns, about 2% of the time. Uh, we get $100 million outcomes, 20x sort of returns, about 5 to 7% of the time. And, and we do get other small wins as well. Um, you know, the basic strategy for us is we try and do a good job sourcing, we try and do a good job selecting, but we try and have a large portfolio. At seed stage, probably at least 100 investments, ideally more like two to 500. Uh, and we actually do service the areas that you've done. We've done about 10 investments in sub-Saharan Africa. We've done over 600 investments outside the U.S. across 60 different countries, and we have people on the ground in most of those markets. Um, so for us, it's really about large portfolio strategy and the stats. Uh, it's about diversification of investments across not just number of companies, but number of people and geographies. Uh, and then trying to just work hard. One last question. Uh, actually, we'll get both of you. Hi, my name is Gus Liano, and really enjoyed the panel. Uh, what Dave mentioned about some of the emerging countries where traditionally VC doesn't go to, um, you know, there's been some stories like, you know, uh, Father Greg Boyle with Homeboy Industries and then a 15-year-old kid winning an a Intel competition with a diagnostic. How do you guys see, for example, with, you know, the refugee crisis or anything like that, turning that into an opportunity to unleash, uh, you know, human potential and some ideas? Refugee crisis where? Uh, like, you know, the people uh, leaving Syria and going to Lebanon, Jordan, and so okay. forth. Uh, actually, the refugee crisis in, in those actually has been a boon for Jordan. They've gotten a lot of very skilled people that are entrepreneurially out of Jordan. It's probably one of the most talented places in the Middle East. I think similarly, you see a lot of those refugees moving to Europe and all the other crap aside. Those people are generally pretty skilled and, you know, willing to take a lot of other jobs that people aren't. I think that's usually a boon. We're out of time, and I just wanted to thank everyone for coming and thank everyone on our panel for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.